As I mentioned last Sunday, there are a lot of ways that you can approach this particular story that's recorded for us in the very first chapter of John's Gospel of Grace, the fourth chapter of John's Gospel of Grace. And really, the woman at the well, Jesus going to Samaria, this whole story, the first 42 verses, there's a lot of ways you can unpack it. But last Sunday, I just determined that for our purposes, we were going to go from the outside and work our way in. Last Sunday, we read the story in its entirety. Then we discussed kind of the larger, more macro perspective, the implications of Jesus leaving Judea. It's a loaded phrase in the Greek. And then going to specifically minister in Samaria. It's a radical scene. The big picture communicates so much of what Jesus is doing. But this morning, we're going to re-examine the story. But this time, we're going to kind of hone in on the more particular micro-implications of the specific interaction that Jesus has with the woman at the well. That will be our main consideration. So let's reread, not the entire story, but instead let's reread the relevant parts of this story as it pertains to Jesus and the woman. Verse 1, chapter 4, Gospel of John. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to Jesus, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. And the woman said to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to Jesus, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you and he. Now jump to verse 28. And then the woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to Jesus. Jump to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in Jesus because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Now before we dive into this conversation that Jesus has with an unnamed woman at the well, I want to take just a few minutes and establish a profile of this woman from what's recorded in our text by John. 
First, we know she's a Samaritan. It's pretty, pretty easy to see that. What's interesting about notifying us that she's a Samaritan is that it does tell us a lot about her. As a Samaritan, the first strike against her would have been her ethnicity. Following the fall of of Judah, the southern kingdom, by the Babylonians, and the removal of the upper echelons of society, the few Jewish communities that remained in the land failed to remain ethnically pure. They intermarried the Gentiles who moved into the region. When the exiled Jews were finally allowed to return home some 70 years later, they end up rejecting this group of people, part Jew, part Gentile, rejecting them as brethren, calling them instead Samaritans because of their compromise. With this in mind, while this woman does possess Hebrew roots, she even mentions our father Jacob. Note, she was of a mixed race. This woman, as all Samaritans, was viewed by the Jews as being a half-breed. In some circles, even traitorous. As such, we can imagine, just because she's a Samaritan, that this woman had personally encountered, to some degree, the overt racism and bigotry of her Hebrew neighbors. In actuality, Jewish violence towards the Samaritans was commonplace. It was normal. She says as much to Jesus when she asked, look at it again, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Strike one, her ethnicity. But as a Samaritan, the second strike against this woman would have been her religion. Though the Samaritans held to many of the same beliefs outlined in the Old Testament. For example, she perceives that Jesus is a prophet. Then she articulates an expectation for the Messiah, things that she would have believed she would have had in common with the Hebrews. The sad thing is that the Samaritans had blended Old Testament principles, Judaism, with pagan superstitions. As just one of what could be many examples, the Samaritans specifically broke with the Jews by worshiping God on Mount Gerizim as opposed to Mount Moriah or the Temple, uh, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. You see, in addition to the ethnic bigotry, this woman would have been the victim of religious persecution. The Samaritans, not just hated because of their race by the Jews, they were hated because they were viewed as heretics. As we even noted last Sunday, in 128 BC, the Jews actually burned their temple on Mount Gerizim to the ground. Didn't smooth over relations. Now, aside from these two strikes against this woman on account that she's a Samaritan, the third strike was the simple fact that she was a woman, the Samaritan woman. With the exception of Roman citizens, Women in the first century possessed few, if any, rights because women were viewed as being inferior to their male counterparts. This woman, just because we're told she's a woman, we can conclude a few things. First, she couldn't work. She couldn't earn a living. Aside from that, her testimony in a court of law would have been completely inadmissible. In a more macro sense, she would have been seen as nothing more than the property of her husband. And beyond the gender bias, as a woman, she would have been at a disadvantage, denied any type of educational opportunities, barred from religious training. See, in this cultural context, aside from the abnormality of a Jew speaking with a Samaritan, it would have been even more scandalous for Jesus to have publicly spoken with a woman, Jew or Samaritan. It was simply uncouth. But that's not all we know of this woman from the text. Consider that in response to Jesus' command to go and call her husband, the woman kind of deflects, right? What does she say? She says, I have no husband. Now, in in a literal sense, she's being truthful. Jesus commends her for that. But Jesus also points out something interesting, right? A bit of insight into her backstory, a bit of information for us. Not only was the man she currently with not her husband, but in actuality, this woman had had five 
husbands. Now, before unpacking this, I do want to take a minute and correct a misconception that many have about this woman. A lot gets written into the story that the story doesn't actually say. Like contrary to how many pastors portray this woman. The text does not say she was a prostitute. Nor does it say she was a, a woman with loose hips or loose morals. Like in no way, shape, or form does the passage say or call her out for an immorality. Like keep in mind that Jesus brings up this woman's life story not to rebuke her. You don't, you don't get that in the text, do you? And nor is he doing it to call her to account. Instead, keep in mind that Jesus brings up her backstory, these things to set the, con the conversation in a direction by which Jesus will reveal himself as the Messiah or her Savior. Not only does she immediately perceive Jesus to be a prophet, but her later testimony, we saw it, we read it, was that Jesus had told her all that she had ever done. And then at the end of the whole narrative, we didn't get that far, but her final confession, it's simple, right? She confesses most gloriously that Jesus was the Christ, the Savior of the world. In actuality, I find it telling that Jesus does not once use the word sin in his exchange with the woman at the well. And what makes it interesting is that Jesus was not shy from calling out sin when it was necessary. That's just an example. In a few chapters, we'll see a woman caught in adultery, brought and thrown before Jesus. And yes, Jesus treats this woman with love and compassion. It's an amazing story, but how does Jesus leave it? He tells that woman what? Go and sin no more. He did confirm that she had sinned, and yet nothing of the sort about this Samaritan woman. Now, there's very little that we know about Samaritanism, which is this, this religion, right? Part Judaism, part pagan customs. We don't know a lot about it. I did a lot of research this week. I even called people and said, in your commentary, you didn't, you didn't answer any of my questions. What's up with that? And, and the, the truth, we just don't know a lot about their, their practices, their religious beliefs. Specifically, we don't know much about their religious beliefs concerning two relevant topics, marriage and divorce. We don't know how their beliefs differed from the Jews. That being said, if let's just say we only looked at the Levitical law to dive into her situation, there are many explanations for her dynamic. The fact that she had been married five times and the man that she was currently with wasn't a husband. Aside from her being a prostitute. Like first, while it would have been undeniably, let's just be real, a string of terrible luck, it's not outside the realm of possibility that this woman had been widowed five times. The text doesn't explain why she had had so many husbands, but we can speculate at least one theory that, that five guys had died on her. It's terrible. Not without precedent, by the way, in Scripture. In that culture, women married young but often married older men. So being widowed, there were so many concessions for that because it happened frequently. Another explanation for her current situation was that this woman had been divorced by five husbands. You know, one of the great debates within Judaism during this day was the interpretation of what constituted a woman being unclean. According to the law of Moses, the only uh, permissible reason to divorce was uncleanness. That was the only accepted grounds. And so the great debate in that day was what is unclean? Like One group of religious thought in the day viewed uncleanness as exclusively the result of adultery, sexual immorality. That that's the intent of what Moses wrote. But there were more liberal influences in Judaism that had a more expansive view. If you do research on this topic, you'll even find a school of thought that defined uncleanness so broadly, if you're a woman, burnt your dinner, 
she was unclean. And it was cause for divorce. As one scholar noted, just in a broad sense, it was not uncommon in this culture for a woman to be married several times. Now, whether it was on account that she had been widowed, divorced, maybe even a combination of the two for that matter, one thing is undeniable. In order to survive in that society, as a woman, she needed to be married. It was the only way that she could provide to survive, explaining why she had been married five times and likely was about to marry for a sixth. Take a moment and consider either scenario as we try to, to, to get into this, this woman's life. Like imagine what her backstory had been like from a very practical standpoint. However you chop it up, she had experienced one heartache followed by another heartache, followed by another heartache. One disappointment, followed by another disappointment, followed by another. This woman had loved, and either the object of her love was taken from her or turned on her. In either scenario, imagine the terrible sorrow. Aside from the personal pain, and the constant disappointment this woman had no doubt experienced over the years, I also think it's safe to assume from our text that there was an obvious social stigma that she would have carried with her. It would have been just inescapable. Like case in point, in verse 7, John tells us that it was about the sixth hour or around noon when this woman came to draw water from Jacob's well. That actually tells us a lot about this woman. Culturally speaking, Beyond the activity of coming to draw water, letting us know that the woman wasn't wealthy. If she was wealthy, there's no way she would have been coming to draw water. That would have been a menial task for servants. But aside from that, the timing of her going to draw water, it's interesting in and of itself. Customarily, the women of the town would come to the community well to draw water for the day early in the morning. Now, now, from a very practical sense, that makes, you know, like, like we, we get why you would do that. A physical task, drawing the water, carrying the water. You would want to do it in the coolest part of the day, the morning. But the activity, like all the women of the town came at once. Drawing water from the well in the morning, it was communal. It was social. It's where all the gossip of the day took place. The very fact that this woman, though, came to draw water at noon, not in the morning, but at noon, seemingly by herself. It reveals much about her standing in this town of Sychar. Yes, being a Samaritan ostracized her from the Jewish culture who persecuted her both ethnically and religiously, and being a woman in general placed her at a significant disadvantage. But... On account of her, her many marriages, however they occurred, her own tribe had abandoned her, had rejected her, kept her at a distance. You see, this woman likely came to the well at a strange hour because she was an outcast. She was a loner. She intentionally avoided coming to draw water with the other ladies because she didn't feel welcome. She was friendless. Because of the glances and the judgments and why so many husbands dying on this woman. What is she doing wrong that she can't keep a man happy? You can imagine it. She just decided, man, it was easier to just come to the well alone. No one else would be there. John opens the chapter by telling us that Jesus leaves Judea because he has an appointment in Samaria. And it doesn't take long for us to discover that Jesus had this lonely woman in mind the whole time. I like this, but when there is a sovereign God active in the world, there is no such thing as a coincidence. John tells us that upon their arrival in Sychar, the capital of Samaria, Jesus being wearied from his journey, intentionally decides to sit down at Jacob's well for a little R&R while the disciples go into town to buy some food. The drive through at Mickey D's. This word, wearied, 
It's an interesting word. It tells us not just that Jesus was physically tired or worn out, but that he's emotionally drained. Like he's utterly exhausted from his journey. Now please realize, in no way does the text tell us that the Samaritan woman came seeking out Jesus. That's pretty obvious. And yet the passage does tell us something interesting. The way the passage sets up the scene is that Jesus specifically left Judea, came to Samaria, to the city of Sychar, to sit down at at Jacob's well at the noon hour. Why? Because he knew this woman would be coming to draw water. Jesus had an appointment with her. Jesus made sure his journey intersected with this woman's. It wasn't an accident. I love the fact that Jesus steps into this woman's life. And I think that there's an application in this for us. In the most mundane of moments. <laughs> She's not on a spirit quest. She's not at church, the synagogue. She's not at a prayer meeting. She's not in her car listening to Chris Tomlin. She's just doing something normal. What she does every day, drawing water. It was part of her routine. Like this woman is coming out to the well with zero anticipation. In no way would she have ever expected that this day, while she went to draw water, she would meet God. That's not how she woke up that morning or set about her day. This woman, a Samaritan woman, who had been in five marriages and was friendless, had no idea that her life was about to forever change by meeting a man at the well, a man named Jesus. And you know, it should also be pointed out, and I'm not trying to get overly detailed, but, but still, I think it's significant, that Jesus knew absolutely everything about this woman before he ever met her. The way the text sets up is that he was thinking of her before he even left, before he ever gets there. And what's more is he knew everything about this woman and none of that deterred him. This woman was was a child of compromise as a Samaritan, a religious heretic, insignificant, a woman, broken, disappointed, an outcast. And yet Jesus specifically goes out of his way to work in her life. That should tell you you're not beyond the same occasion. As we approach this conversation, I need to remind you of the larger end game. We dealt with this last Sunday. You can explore it more by going back and listening, but I just need to set the big picture. Jesus and the whole scene, going to Samaria, the whole deal, Jesus is reconstituting here by going to Sychar, which is also known as Shechem, the very place that God first called Abraham when he entered the land, the place where he then called again Jacob, this place where God called people to make them their family, he comes to this well, to this town, to reconstitute who would be his people. He begins in Jerusalem, then moves to Judea, before going where? Samaria. Sounds like a similar instruction he would give us called the Great Commission. In a way, Jesus is laying the framework here for calling to himself a new wife, a new bride, the bride of Christ. You know, on a side note, I didn't mention this last Sunday. I didn't mention it because I didn't think of it until this week. So I'll just add this in. It's not an accident. Like, think about the fact that this scene takes place. We, We looked at the fact that it was in Sychar, Shechem. But consider it takes place at a well. Place that into some biblical context for a minute. Do you know what a well was, biblically speaking? It was the prime hookup spot. Men hooked up with women at the well. Now, I'm not saying that about Jesus and this woman, but about Jesus calling a bride a wife. Think about it. Abraham sends Eleazar, and where does he find Rebekah to bring back to Isaac? At a well. Genesis 24. And then where does Jacob end up meeting Rachel? At a well. Where does Moses meet Zipporah? Exodus 2, at a well. These relationships all begin at a well. How interesting Jesus is initiating a relationship with a new bride 
at a well. The other component that's kind of central to understanding the flow of, of an interesting, but I will admit, kind of complicated conversation is that, and keep it in mind as we look at it, Jesus, the entire point here, the purpose of the conversation is that Jesus intends to reveal himself to this woman as the Christ, the Savior of the world. So always keep that in mind as we work our way through the nuances. This dialogue, it will take some twists, it will take some turns, but knowing the end game that Jesus wants her to see him as a Savior, well, it helps understand the flow. Let's get into it. Imagine this woman's surprise. It's a normal day, normal routine. When she arrives to the well to find a Jewish man sitting there by himself, alone, immediately thoughts, right? Why is this dude here? Why is he alone? That Jew, does he not have GPS? They just don't come into Samaria. He's at a well with nothing to draw with. This is all weird. It's all bizarre. What's going on? Not only was this offbeat, the whole scene, but then things grow stranger when Jesus speaks to her and asks a question, she walks up and he says, Would you give me a drink of water? Jesus, a Hebrew man, asking such a question of a Samaritan woman, broke every single societal norm. It was just unheard of. Which means that her surprise to find a Jewish man sitting at a well now turns into total disbelief by the question. Like, not only would a Jew have nothing to do with a Samaritan, but a Jewish man would have never spoken publicly with a woman. And yet, in these four words, Jesus is crossing all kinds of social taboos. Aside from how radical that is, the very nature of Jesus' request for her to draw for him a drink of water intended to demonstrate. Like, the point is that Jesus is demonstrating kindness. Now you would say, how is asking you to do me a favor demonstrating kindness or respect? Well, in Eastern culture, Eastern thought, the very act of, of an unsolicited request or asking a favor of someone meant to communicate that I would be in your debt. There was kindness, there was respect. Jesus is placing himself in this woman's debt. Now, as you play the scene out in your mind, it's likely that between verses 8 and 9, so Jesus asks a question, but then the flow of the conversation just kind of keeps moving. It's likely there's a pause, that the woman actually draws for Jesus a drink of water. <laughs> this woman is totally and completely dismayed by what's happening. There's a Jewish man sitting at the well. He asks for a drink of water. She's looking at him like, okay, lowering the bucket, pulling the bucket back up. Here you go, pal. And then the conversation moves on. Jesus' request demonstrated kindness. It demonstrated gratitude, but, and you can understand it, for the Samaritan, like, her curiosity is going to get the better of her. Like, what's happening demands an inquiry, right? So he's already broken some customs, so she's going to reply, gets him some water, and then in verse 9, she says to Jesus, she asks, this is curious, like, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Just a logical question. <laughs> I love the fact that this woman, she's kind of tenacious, and I love it. She's bold. She doesn't refuse Jesus. She gets some water, but she's bold enough to ask a question, to scratch her curiosity. Like, she doesn't avoid the 800-pound gorilla in the room. How is it that you, and you can just underline that, like that aptly articulates her wonderment. Like for all the reasons that we've stated, she had to know why a Jewish man would ask a drink from her knowing she's a Samaritan and a woman. Look at Jesus' response to her disbelief that he would willingly show kindness. So that's what's happening. Jesus shows kindness. She wants to know why. So verse 10 Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, 
This woman is initially surprised to find somebody at the well at high noon. Then she's in disbelief to discover he's a Jew, shocked when he proceeds to ask her a question. Jesus responds, and she's left a little perplexed. Like, it's kind of a weird answer to such a straightforward question. Now, to help unpack what Jesus is articulating, let me kind of paraphrase the verse. Jesus says to her, If you knew who I am, or, or literally, who it is who says to you. So if you knew who I am and what I've come to give, the gift of God, you would have asked me for a drink and I would have given you living water. Like That's what Jesus is saying. <laughs> if you knew who I am, well, you'd be asking things of me. Now notice, at the core of Jesus' statement here was the fact that this woman is clueless to what? To who Jesus is. To his identity. This woman's question. It manifested from the love, the respect, the kindness that Jesus had demonstrated by asking her for a drink of water, placing himself into her debt. In response, though, she wanted to know what would motivate such grace. <laughs> Why? Because she had likely never experienced that before, especially from a Jew. So, in order to address her inquiry, how is it that you? Jesus is moving her thought process to two things. You want to jot them down, jot them down. Two things. He's wanting her, how is it that you? Well, there's two things you need to keep in mind, hon. First, the gift of God. We need to talk about that. And also the giver of said gift. Again, Jesus is saying, if you knew who I am and what I've come to give, you would have never asked that question because you would have known the answer. Now, Jesus will begin by explaining the gift of God in order to set up the grand reveal. Now, it's important to point out that this phrase that Jesus uses, living water, is in many ways a cultural play on words, something that we don't, we don't really grasp in our culture. Now, this woman had come to Jacob's well in order to draw out from the well water. But the water was stagnant. You see, spring water, river water, was preferable, moving water, because it was fresh. It was pure, since it was moving or alive, living, versus stagnant and dead. It, it lacked imperfections. In employing this phrase, Jesus is contrasting the well water, right, with living water. Like Jesus is contrasting what she'd come to Jacob's well to draw with what he was offering to give. <laughs> For a more thorough explanation of how that ties into religion versus relationship, I'd refer you to last Sunday's study. But beyond this, Jesus is doing something else Vitally important. You can't miss it. He's asking her a question. Not, not, not straight out, but it's implied. He's asking her if she's actually thirsty. While, while she's trying to understand what motivated Jesus, Jesus is wanting her to consider herself. Are, are you content with that? Are you satisfied with what you're getting from this well? There is living water. Is this enough? Or, or do you long for something more? It's the thought that Jesus is planting in her head. Now, as you read her response, don't forget, the woman literally has no idea who Jesus is. He's a total stranger. She's never heard Jesus teach a Bible study, expound on Scripture, perform a miracle. She doesn't know his name. Clueless to the backstory, Mary and Joseph, swaddling clothes. This is a random dude at a well. So, with that in mind, verse 11 is not all that outlandish. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, drank from it, he and his sons and livestock? Now, in response to Jesus' appeal for her to consider what she's been drinking and whether it's been good enough, there is no question that she's processing all of this into the natural realm, right? Because she's like, wait a second. Like the well's deep and you got nothing to draw with. So this is weird. 
But she does ask two questions here that, that reveal a, a, at least a flickering of some spiritual intuition. She first asked Jesus, where do you get that living water? But then she asks another question, which is interesting. She says, are you greater than our father Jacob? Now in verse 13, Jesus will begin to answer these two questions. Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, I find it so very fascinating that Jesus moves her thought process from drinking, right, an outward activity, to what? To thirst, which is an internal condition. That's not an accident. Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water, and I can see as the, as the motion picture's playing in my mind, I can see Jesus pointing to the well. Like, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. It's not rocket science. That makes sense. But whoever drinks of the water, I, and I can see Jesus pointing to himself, that I will give him, will never thirst. You know, in order to know who Jesus is, which is the, in, the intention of the conversation, it's helpful to know the radical nature of what Jesus came to offer because he's the only one that can offer it. Jesus will get to the question, where do you get this living water in a few minutes? But notice that Jesus first answers her question about being greater than Jacob. And how does he do it? He contrasts the well, the water his well yielded as opposed to the water that he came to provide. In a way, Jesus is saying to her, let me kind of paraphrase it again. Woman, let me tell you how I'm greater than Jacob. You see this well? You can drink and drink and drink and drink and drink from the water from it, and your thirst will never, ever, ever be quenched. Now, how am I greater than Jacob? I will give you something that you can drink and drink and drink and drink from and never thirst again. This duplicate phrase, whoever drinks, mentioned in both, it's an active tense, implying a, a continual drinking. Now here's the point that Jesus is making, because I think it's crystal clear. In one dynamic, an outward activity, drawing water from Jacob's well, it always failed. And why? Because it, it was an outward attempt to address an internal need of being thirsty. While in the other dynamic of what Jesus describes, enjoying something he gives, not something you draw, but something he gives you, it permanently satisfies. Why? Because it does something inside. The gears are turning in this woman's head, and I think he immediately answers an unspoken question. This woman is thinking what you should be. How does the water that Jesus offers quench an internal thirst? Like, I get what you're saying, but the how, you're not articulating. But, but he says, he answers it, right? The water I give, you want to know how it satisfies, how it quenches a thirst? Because it becomes in the person a fountain of water that springs up into everlasting life. Jesus is saying that this living water that we receive becomes in the person a fountain, an internal spring. Like, I love the contrast. The woman comments concerning Jacob's well, right? <laughs> the well's deep, bro. Drawing water requires a lot of work, man. Tools, you don't even have any of it. It demands effort, energy, just to get a sip. And yet in contrast to that, Jesus now refers to something radically different. Oh, you don't even have to, to draw it. You don't have to earn it. A, it's inside, and then it becomes a fountain, that springs up. You don't have to force it, work for it. It's just there. It bubbles forth. <laughs> Where does the living water come from? Well, it's first something Jesus gives, something you participate in, something received, and something that bubbles forth internally. Now, there should be no surprise that in response to what Jesus has just said, the woman immediately replies, look at verse 10, verse 15, and she says, sir, give me the water. Yeah, I want that, that I may not thirst, nor have to come back to this place to draw. And yet the exchange that follows is not what she would have expected, right? 
because Jesus says, go and call your husband. She says, I have no husband. He says, you've well said that you have, you know, no husband. You've had five. The one you're with is not your husband. Now, back in verse 10, Jesus initiates the conversation by stating, look at it again. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. Now that she clearly understands what the gift of God Jesus is referring to is, right? It's why she asked Jesus, hey, give me that living water so that I'm, I would not thirst. While she gets what the gift of God is, she still doesn't know who Jesus is. And therefore, she's still wondering, where do you get the living water? Now, notice how she begins this request. Sir, sir, give me this water. Sir. You know, in order for this woman to fully grasp all that Jesus was offering her, what the living water really was, she needed to know who Jesus was, who it was saying to you, give me a drink. Again, this is why Jesus supernaturally lays out her backstory. He's not judging her. He's not airing her dirty laundry. It's just them. You see, Jesus is trying to expand her imagination, trying to get her to see him in a different light. And she does. Like, not surprisingly, her perspective immediately expands. Verse 19, she says, I perceive you're a prophet. From a sir to a prophet. And since this was a case, Jesus as a prophet, she asks a theological question central to the distinction and the differences between the Jews and the Samaritans about where do you worship? Our fathers worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. You Jews say it's Jerusalem. Like in her mind, the woman had intertwined, like everyone had, the true worship of God with a physical location. Jesus, which is it? What's the better place to worship? Gerizim, Jerusalem. What do you say? You're a prophet. I perceive that. But look at Jesus' response to that question about the location. He says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now just pause for a second. Jesus is basically saying something gnarly. The location, you're all, like everybody else, bent up on the location. Where do we worship? But Jesus is saying here, the location, it doesn't matter at all. Like it has no bearing on true worship. In actuality, Jesus here is prophesying that the debate as to where to worship would be completely mute. He says the hour is coming when no one's going to be worshiping in either place, which was true because in 70 AD, Jerusalem was knocked down and you weren't worshiping there either. You're bent out on the location. Who cares? Instead, then Jesus explains what? The hour now is when true worshipers will worship the Father, not about a location, but instead in spirit and truth, because that's what the Father is seeking. Like Jesus' point was that God was more concerned not with the location of the worshiper, but the essence of the worship. What did the Father care about? What was the Father seeking? Those that would worship in spirit and in truth. It's a gnarly, radical idea. The disciples would have had no clue. So why are we going to the temple? What's the point of that? And that was Jesus' point. Now, since this was the case, how radical this statement was. The woman's only response was to concede. Because her answer kind of seems bizarre, right? Because what does she say? She says, well, I know that the Messiah is coming, who's called the Christ, and when he comes, he'll tell us all things. Like, it's as though she's kind of saying here, I don't know what you're saying, man. Like, like I don't know if I get it. I don't know if that's even true. But I do know, I do know that when the Messiah comes, like, it'll all make sense then. Like, the Messiah will probably do a better job explaining it than you, buddy. It's kind of what she's saying. And, and, but here's the deal. It's at that moment, that the stage has been set for what? For Jesus to fully reveal his identity, which was the whole point of the conversation. Because Jesus' response is what? He says to her, oh, you're waiting for the Messiah? I who speak to you am he. And why was Jesus greater than Jacob? How could he offer this woman living water so that she would never thirst again? <laughs> 
He was the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah that she was looking for. There is no question that in this moment, the light bulb goes off. She understood. John says that the woman, and note, by that point, the disciples have come back, but he makes the observation that the woman leaves her water pot. I don't need that anymore. She runs into the city and she says to the men, come, a man has told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? It's amazing. Now, now there are a lot of pastors who like to close out this passage in such a way that they, they, I think, kind of sadly land on a lot of platitudes. A lot of platitudes. I could point out that Jesus was inviting this woman to drink from a well much different than anything this world had to offer. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It's a good, that's a good line. But what does that even mean? Drink from a well. Huh? I could, I could say why this world only offers temporary reprieves that can never quench an internal thirst. Not so with Jesus. And you're like, that sounds good. But what? I could tell you, you know, you can work to draw water that will fail to satisfy, or you can drink from living water Jesus offers. Still, I don't know what that means. Yeah, it's true that whoever drinks of the water that Jesus gives will never thirst, and that that water will become in him a fountain springing up into everlasting life. But how? Like, have you ever gone to a Bible study and heard the great concluding argument and you're like, I don't know how that applies. It sounds great. It fits my religiosity. But man, I don't know if I'm chewing on that. Like, like it's vague. These points are true, but they're vague. Which is why this is how we'll conclude. Don't forget the entire purpose of the conversation. And don't forget the one reality that Jesus communicated that changed her life. It wasn't about living water and versus stale water or what well you're drawing from or this, that, and the other. It wasn't about where you worship at, at Gerizim or Jerusalem or this, that, and the other. The one reality, the one thing revealed, the one truth that changed everything was that Jesus was her Savior. It was his identity. Yes, Jesus was offering living water. Yes, Jesus was offering something that permanently satisfied an internal need. But how did you receive any of those things? Possessing a relationship with Jesus. You want to drink living water? You want to keep drinking living water? Meet Jesus. Have a relationship with Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Read his scriptures so Jesus can reveal himself. Speak to him because he wants to hear from you. When you come to church, worship him for he's real and here. Drink living water. Let me just phrase it a different way. Just hang out with Jesus. Relate with Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Follow Jesus. The whole point is that when you see Jesus for who he is, it changes everything. And it affords you so much. Because you don't have to earn something when he wants to give it. But it's hard to, to get if you ain't hanging out. The whole purpose of the dialogue was Jesus wanted this woman to see what he wants you to see. Which is why this might have been a mundane thing. I go to church every Sunday. I sit in the same seat every week. I'm not pointing anyone out. I wasn't really expecting anything this morning. And then Jesus showed up at my well. He says, I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to be part of my family. I don't care where you came from, what mistakes have been made. I care that, that I want you to be my kid, be part of my family, that I love you, and I want to work in you, and I want to give you something this world can't offer. Maybe that's you this morning. And if it is, I would ask just in the quietness of your soul and if everyone would bow your head and close your eyes that you would...